For those outside the United States, please take note that all measurements presented here are done in U.S. Imperial. There are many free online tools that you can use to convert U.S. dollars and Microsoft point values to your own native currency. I must warn you, though, that in many cases, those outside the United States find themselves paying more for retail games and DLC than we in the U.S. do. So don't be surprised if you find that your prices are nearly double ours. Hello, fine folks. I'm sick today, so I apologize if I sound a tad nasally. It's been a while since I've posted anything of value on this channel, and I wanted to come back with something meaningful. And what could be more meaningful than a semi-lengthy essay about something that affects our games every time you log on to your system? I'm talking, of course, about DLC. Well, today Gears of War 3 came out, and everyone is shitting themselves over it, throwing uh, titles like Game of the Year, and Best Game Ever Created, and Best Xbox Exclusive at it. <sighs> but it's interesting to note this little screenshot. This is the current downloadable content available for Gears of War 3. What I really want you to look at is two things, the release dates and the download sizes. Every single piece of DLC was released the day before Gears 3 came out, and if you'll notice, they're all weapon skins, except for one, but let's get past that and go straight to the download sizes. Epic and Microsoft thought it would be okay to release cosmetic DLC before the game came out. That's worse than Day 1 DLC, and it's worse than content that's already on the disc being locked unless you purchase an activation key disguised as a download. This is Day Negative 1 DLC. They're wanting to charge you extra for the game before it even comes out. This is the problem with DLC. It started off as a great way for developers, namely console developers, to maintain interest in their game and further develop it after its release. Over the past four years, however, it has quickly become nothing more than a way for developers and publishers to excuse cutting content out and selling it back to you later. Disk space isn't even an issue. According to VGArabia.com, Gears of War 3's install size is 7.22 GB. The maximum amount the XGD3 DVD type the game comes on is capable of storing 7.95 GB of data. However, the game itself is only 6.8 GB as the remaining disk space is reserved for anti-piracy solutions and DVD video. Once we do the math, we learn that the anti-piracy measures in DVD video take up only 0.42 gigabytes of disk space. Now combined with the actual game data, it takes up 7.22 gigabytes. And since the XGD3 DVDs can store up to 7.95 gigabytes of data, there still remains 0.73 gigabytes of unused disk space. When converted to a smaller unit, this equates to 747.52 megabytes. This space is enough to include on the same DVD all the content currently available on the Xbox Live Marketplace. Does something smell fishy? Could it be that content was cut as an excuse to make more of a profit on a game that's guaranteed to sell millions? And let's not be so quick to blame Epic Games here. When it comes to Epic, Microsoft has a history of being shifty about DLC right from the start. After the release of the first Gears of War, Epic Games wanted to support the game with free updates and DLC. In the end, though, Microsoft was the one funding the game. Though the first few packs were free, the third one was the first time we saw a Gears of War map pack being charged for. From May to September of 2007, the Hidden Fronts map pack costed 800 Microsoft points, or the equivalent of 10 US dollars. The maps did eventually become free, but then came the issue of Unreal Tournament 3. This was the only version of the game which did not support user mods, and you could only use with an Xbox 360 controller. Of course, the reason for this is, user-generated content is the biggest threat to paid content there is. If anyone can make their own maps, why would they bother paying more for maps they can make themselves? It doesn't make a lot of sense from a business standpoint, does it? And while I'm thinking about Microsoft, let's take a look at their purchase system, which a lot of distributors are currently modeling their own after, and that's scary. As it stands, every 200 Microsoft points is equivalent to 2.50 US dollars. The problem is, you can't choose how many Microsoft points you want to get exactly. If you buy them directly from Xbox Live, you're given the option of 400 points, or $5, 800 points, or $10, 1600 points, or $20, or 4000 points, $50. You can't set custom Microsoft point amounts to purchase, and if you buy prepaid cards from a retailer, you'll often find that they only carry amounts of 1600 or 4000 points. The problem with this is, if you want to buy something that costs, say, a dollar, or 80 Microsoft points, it would cost you at least $5 to purchase it. Since you can't just purchase 80 points, you have to purchase 400. It's a system created and designed to abuse the limitations of digital distribution and credit cards, and that's not right. 
DLC nowadays is what would have passed for unlockables last generation. Did you kill 1,000 enemies? Here's a rainbow skin for your weapon. Did you beat the game on the hardest difficulty? Here's a cheat menu. It's ridiculous. DLC is supposed to be expansion packs, not content that should have been in there from the start. The only two companies doing DLC right nowadays are Bethesda and Rockstar. Their DLC isn't actually DLC at all, but expansion packs. Undead Nightmare is an almost entirely new game that adds new weapons, locations, multiplayer modes, and more for $20. Compare this to Call of Duty's $15 map packs, which typically only include four new maps, and you see that DLC isn't as good as it used to be. Undead Nightmare gives an almost entirely new game for a third of the original price, and Call of Duty's map packs give you things that could have been in there at the start for a fourth of the original price. But as we covered earlier with Epic and Microsoft, developers are almost always never to blame for this kind of thing, because in the end, they're the developers, not the publishers. If you don't know how the video game industry works, the developers are the ones who actually make the game, and the publishers are the ones who get it on the store shelves and give the developers money to make the game. Since the publishers have this kind of weight to throw around in a game's development process, it's fair to say that they tend to be responsible for ridiculous DLC. Sure, they can make a game $60 and make a profit per copy of say $20, but why do that when they could make a profit per copy of $20 and then sell $15 DLC, which if somebody buys all the content for that game, could bring them up to a profit of $75 per copy? The answer is business, and corporations are businesses, and gaming went corporate with this generation. That's why we see so many sequels as opposed to new games. Large companies stick with things they know will sell, because it's an almost guaranteed profit. Music does this, movies do this, and games are no exception. The biggest example is Call of Duty, which changes hardly anything each game and sells more than Avatar each new generation. So in the end, we notice something. A strange pattern that isn't so strange in hindsight. The majority of developers and publishers I've mentioned here today are console-focused. Why? Because consoles are the ultimate in DRM. You can mod your console and get content for free, but you risk being banned at any given moment. Plus, a lot of console games will try to sell on their multiplayer aspect. And what fun is multiplayer without anyone to play with? You could LAN, sure. But that's why LAN is dying a slow and painful death on console platforms. They want you connected to their official servers at all times, and if they see you didn't purchase something, they ban you. Sounds fair, you say they should have paid for it. But what about the people who don't pay for it simply because they don't want to? One example is the Halo series. When a new map pack would come out, it would lock out certain playlists until you purchased it. The reason for this is giving you incentive to purchase a piece of DLC you may not even like. You don't exactly see many companies giving out demos of add-ons, do you? The point I'm trying to make here is this. Sell your consoles, get a gaming PC, pirate stuff you don't want, publishers will start to pay attention to you. I guarantee it. Thank you for your time.